Hello everyone, welcome to our Palo Alto studio. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. We're here for a digital conversation, part of our new digital events, part of our new structure of bringing people into the studio and also doing remotes. We'd love to do that in the era of the travel bans, but it's always great to have local Silicon Valley executives and startups here. Milan Desai, CEO of Century IO is here with me, former VMware industry uh, executive, CEO of Century IO, hot startup. Thanks for coming in. Thank you for having me. So you can drive in, you don't have to fly anywhere, it's all good, <laughs> nowhere in masks, the coronavirus <laughs> is crazy. Um, so glad we have the studio and get this content acquisition, thanks for coming in. Uh, I want to get your take on your company before we get into the, um, the industry thing, because I think you look at some of the most successful categories that just came out of nowhere. You know, you look at AI ops, for instance, and driving, uh, you know, observability. I mean, what is observability? That became a company went public, pager do, the list just goes on and on. The, the cloud has created this agile market where real time, and then a lot of automation is going on, so whether it's error logs like a Splunk does, and that's scaled up. You get to doing something very interesting with software code. That's not just something breaks, a phone rings. There's a lot of going on. You're, mm -hmm. you're this really kind of the tailwind here for you with cloud scale. What is Century doing? What's their secret sauce? So um, the simplest way I would put it is we help you measure and monitor your code in production in close to real time. So what does that mean? You know, you, you look at all, all of the companies that we talk about, whether it's a John Deere uh, on one end or a Spotify on the other, they're all getting more digital in nature, which means they're all trying to interact with their customers more often, building apps with an interface, with an API. And as we all know, through our own personal experiences, if you don't get a great experience, you simply move on. So you pull up your app, you pull up Uber, it's not working, let me look at left, right? Uh, that's the kind of consumer yeah. behavior that's starting to take in. So Meaning you don't really know as the owner of the app if they're abandoning or not, it's just down correct. sales. Or correct, and so what we do is we help developers monitor how their usages of their code in production. So as users hit errors, uh, a checkout button is not working, or a user is having a bad experience on a mobile phone, whereas the same application on a browser looks fine, we in real time give a notification saying X number of users on this type of device, on this type of interface, are having issues. And not just that it's an alert, it's an alert which says, this is the issue, this is the line of code where the issue is taking place, this is the potential commit that you did in your Git repository, yeah. which is causing it. So it's the full kind of uh, metadata around the issue, which typically would be, what, two days? A ticket is filed, support may look at it, hey, customer has an issue, let's reproduce it. Well, the customer's yeah. gone. Yeah. So this is all done in real or time. Or it could be a complete topics. blind spot too, you don't know, right? This is the thing. This is why I love this whole digital transformation world where instrumentation is reimagining how everything's being done. So for instance, you could see a code push and you go, okay, it's in production. And then why, why are sales down? Why is usage down? And then you got to do a post-mortem. Correct. No one called, right? <laughs> you just go, what the hell happened? Fingers are blaming, he did it. Um, here, you're, you're trying to get to the point where you can see that error earlier. Or before or after, during, how does it work? It's almost in real time, close to real time. As the user hits the error, immediately through either PagerDuty, Slack, email, whichever your communication medium is, you get to know a user or a set of users are having an issue. You click it, you go to this portal, all the metadata is right there. So it's in real time. Uh, and so to exactly your point, it's not after the fact, yeah. right? It's happening. And so uh, the, the CTO of Tackle.io uh, said it best. It's a startup that helps companies get on to marketplaces. He said, hey, we found issues before our customers even filed an uh, issue against us. So, you know, we, this helps us deliver true customer experience uh, as a development team. So on the, the developers, the target profile, I get that, and they're coding away, they don't have time to do research. They be like, oh, I better bolt on some, some instrumentation here. That's been the success for me. Look at like what Datadog's done in DevOps. Just the easy onboarding, free, use it. Is that the same model you guys are taking, this free land, adopt? then expand, so is it a freemium? Can you explain the business model? Yeah, so uh, Sentry is uh, open source, uh, and so customers can 
uh, take the piece of software that we have as is fully functional and run it themselves in their data center on their cloud. Uh, or they can choose a SaaS version from us and we offer kind of like a free version and then you pay for the plan. So what we typically see is customers turn it on, developers turn it on and they like it and then um, the, the best quote I got recently was one CEO who said, hey, you know, I don't send you that many events but I see the value of what you do so I decided to pay you, right? So they went from free to paid uh, and that's kind of a typical pattern that we see and the best thing about this is it takes you approximately four lines of code to get started. Four lines of code in your code and you get, start getting the benefits of Sentry. Well, it's a good sign for monetization when you got the, you're paying it forward literally with cash. Um, I want to ask you the difference between the open source version because I saw in the origination story, it was, it was really interesting. They had, a, they were, had jobs and they saw this side project grow uh, into a real opportunity. Um, and it's always good to see the open source not die, right? So there's been maintain the project. When would someone, keep, use the open source. Is that the hardcore folks or, so SaaS obviously makes sense, it's easier if you're doing a lot of extra support and whatnot on top of it. But what's the use case for the folks who are going to bring it in house, load it on their cloud? I think we leave it to our customers to decide that and we've seen uh, folks who say, hey, you know, we have a, we're going to try it out, it's a small, we have got a good DevOps practice, we're going to get it up and running. Uh, here's what happened uh, with one of my teams at VMware. Um, the, uh, the engineer in charge looked at it and said, it's not worth my time given what the price on SaaS is, right? So like our smallest plan is $29, which satisfies most uh, startups or small software projects. And his point was like, hey, you know, it's, it's almost better for me to start and using that versus yeah, well, they were, trying to they, do. They were using NSX, I'm sure Pat Gels was like, <laughs> get to ship the next product. <laughs> well, this is the trade off, right? I mean, so that's what's beautiful open source. If you want to bring it in and, and make it work for yourself, that trade-off has to be economically there. Correct. So you have a nice balance of, if you're hardcore, no problem. Please use, use it. it yep. Contribute, be part of the team. Mm -hmm. But if you want ease of use and all the bells and whistles and the speed. I think it comes down to what we're starting to see, which is how much do you care about getting to value faster? And where is your value? Is it is it in kind of running and operating all these pieces of software? Or is it in you know getting value to your end customer? So if you're focused on building your business, we are this value add that kind of gets you there faster. So stop focusing on kind of building the infrastructure, start delivering kind of the value to the business. So I got to ask you, so are you the CEO? So the, the founders who I have not met, I'm looking forward to interviewing them. Um, they seem pretty cool. Um, I'm sure they probably said, oh, this guy from VMware, he's probably the big company guy, because they were like, we're going to drop box, you know, <laughs> engineers. I could almost imagine their, who, what, they're, what they're like. Probably skeptical, it's this VMware guy. How did you get through the interview process? Uh, obviously you, you're the CEO. Um, you made it. Were they skeptical? <laughs> what worked? Why did why you why'd you go there? You know, uh, the best thing about this transition is um, Chris and David. Uh, uh, so David was the CEO. Uh, he's now the CTO. Uh, he's the founder creator along with Chris. And it was his decision uh, to bring someone uh, into the company given that we are seeing this, you know, we are now at 20,000 plus customers and he felt like he wanted to kind of go back to building and, and creating yeah. and bring a partner in crime. So that was the good part. Um, I would say like we started talking and we are at the same energy level, uh, you know, uh, so I think it just worked out in the way we communicated uh, and you've known me for a bit. Yeah. I'm kind of uh, hands on. I like, you know, to kind of get into things yeah. and, and build businesses. So I think the profile matched out and both of us took our time. So it was a, you know, a long dating process yeah. where we got to know each other, uh, not just as you know, what we do for work, uh, but you know, how we operate and had coffee and lunch and dinner. And well, it is a dating, I mean, dating and marriage is always a thing, but founders are, it's, it's a tough move to make. I mean, for founders to one, be self-aware to, to bring in someone else, but also the fit has to be there. And a lot of entrepreneurs just check the box and try to hire someone too fast that could fail or it gets jammed down by the VCs, you know, someone, yeah, so the founders are pretty, pretty kind of reluctant. So mm -hmm. that's interesting that you did that. Yeah, he's, you know, he's been thinking, you know, the thing about uh, David is he's super thoughtful uh, and, uh, you know, hopefully you'll get to see him soon. Um, he's been thinking, he had been thinking about this for a bit and he took his time uh, and he worked through the process and, and that's why I said it was, it felt like we were not just talking about me joining as a CEO as much as us getting to know each other and building this for the long run. Uh, and so we really took our time on both ends. And he wanted to get back on, uh, in the, into the engine of the business. He's a developer, right? He liked the code, he just don't want to. 
Yeah, it's 20,000 customers, you got to get hiring people, it's HR <laughs> issues, it's, it's probably like, I don't want to do that. That yeah. and, and you know, it was kind of the personality yeah. thing, right? Grid and grind, yeah. uh, you know, we, we kind of, can somebody come in, have the passion, yeah. uh, the same way he believes in, in what we do, and he saw that, and, and I saw that in him, and I'm like, this is a great opportunity uh, that I cannot uh, forgo. So talk about the, uh, obviously I love modern, the modern startups because, you know, there's, you're on the right side of history when you got cloud at your tailwind uh, and the kind of DevOps-like vibe you got going on with, I know it's not DevOps, but it's more like cloud scale uh, and, and, and the agility. How are you guys organized? Do you guys have uh, virtual teams? Do you have a central office? Is there a physical place? Do people come in? What's the, how, did, how is the company's philosophy on, on the work environment? So um, we uh, actually have three locations, uh, one in San Francisco, which is the headquarters of, uh, where we are located, and then in Vienna, Austria, where one of the early engineers uh, and pioneers uh, uh, you know, live, and so we built uh, around uh, that um, person and that location. No one's complaining about that. No. Vienna's yeah, not a bad place. Not to a bad out. place. I haven't visited yet. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking forward to it. Um, I was supposed to be there in April, but given the circumstances, I'm uh, postponing it. And we uh, recently started this past year in Toronto. Um, and so we are... So three strong areas for tech talent, for sure. And then we do have uh, some employees working from home. So uh, we try and hire the best uh, and then we accommodate. Uh, we, but we do try to kind of cluster around these three locations. So I got to get your take as a CEO. Obviously we're all grappling with this uh, work at home, COVID-19, the coronavirus um, is impacting. Everything's being canceled here in Silicon Valley. I would say Seattle's more of a hot spot than our area. Obviously China is China. What's the view that you guys are taking right now? You're telling people to work at home. Obviously events are being canceled, places mm -hmm. where people are doing biz dev. KubeCon was canceled, Dell Technology World was canceled. I mean, everything's being canceled. Um, how's that affecting your business and what's your philosophy? How are you guys executing through this tough time? I think as a um, company, we've kind of taken the step for having people work from home. Uh, and we did it uh, on a location by location basis. So uh, for folks in San Francisco, especially because folks were commuting on public transportation and other things, we wanted to make our team feel comfortable. Uh, and so we've instituted a work from home policy uh, for I think we said two weeks, but I think it's going to keep uh, going in until we get a clear signal from the government, uh, both locally and at the federal level. Um, so that's kind of where we are as a team. Uh, and then what we noticed was the Austrian government kind of had similar regulations. So everyone's working from home. Um, Slack, uh, you know, Google Hangouts. Uh, we're spending a lot of time on video, making sure we are connected as a team. Uh, and, and, you know, just that spirit uh, of how we operate and talk to each other continues. Cool. As a business, we are a bottoms up business. So what I mean by that is folks sign up. Uh, they use the product, uh, and developers are right now globally still fully functional, uh, the only yeah. difference being they're now working from home. So we feel like as a business, um, we, we'll be fine, uh, and we are ensuring that our customers through this transition uh, and through this period of kind of unknowns are able to, to continue to be successful for their customers. It's funny, I was talking with someone, it's like there's going to be some Aussie sectors, like events that are going to take a big hit, South Bike are canceled, Coachella's being canceled, all the tech events are being canceled, obviously we're going to be doing our stuff at the studio with virtual events with theCUBE, but certain things are going to be different. You're going to see pregnancy boom, you know, nine months later, people are going to be having kids because they're home alone or divorces, depending <laughs> how you look at it. Um, but productivity, developer-wise, has been talked about as, actually developers want to just crank out some code. They don't have to come into the office. It can be more, I mean, you, don't, you can still be productive. Develop, developers have been doing this for a decade, yeah, I think, at least, if not more. Uh, you know, I, I think you, you know, I think there might be uh, scenarios of adjustment, a period of adjustment, uh, and then uh, folks will get comfortable. So it's super important uh, to create that engagement model, whether, uh, you know, do you have the tooling to keep that team engaged? And there are companies that are completely remote, and so we're making sure we learn from their best practices around that. But I do believe yeah. that uh, uh, for tech companies or even for, uh, manufacturing companies focused on building software, developers are going to be productive. Okay, so a baby boom's coming, divorce <laughs> rate's going to go up, and productivity is skyrocketing. <laughs> For developers. For developers. <laughs> well, I mean, it's a good time. Okay, I got to get your take on the industry now. Okay, obviously,
putting all the coronavirus aside, we saw a surge in public cloud check mm -hmm. done. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously when you have VMware with NSX coming in um, and becoming the engine uh, with the software-defined networking as part of the Sierra piece, you're starting to see hybrid clear as day, it's going to happen. Multi-cloud's on the horizon. Mm -hmm. So you now have a three-wave cloud game going on. Wave one, done. Wave two is hybrid. Wave three, maybe bigger than them all with multi-cloud. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with that trend analysis and what's your take on that? So uh, this is where I'll probably kind of look back at my time at VM where I think, uh, you know, definitely see uh, the multi-cloud wave catching on, but I would use the word multi-cloud as in uh, not a app spread across three clouds as much as, you know, a company choosing to have uh, certain assets in AWS, certain assets in Azure, certain in Google. Uh, so I don't see yet this idea of an app being stretched across the three <laughs> clouds, but definitely uh, while I was at VMware, VMware tried that. <laughs> <laughs> while I was at VMware and in talking to customers, we definitely saw adoption yeah. of multiple clouds, and that's that's where you know when I was working with the cloud health team, uh, this idea of managing cost and security across three clouds became very common as a pattern that came up. Yes. So definitely see that as a kind of directional thing that a lot of organizations are doing. Yeah, the idea of just rapidly shifting app workloads based on pricing, all that stuff, I think is, is aspirational at best because development teams are now just getting their groove on with hybrid and operation, cloud operations. So I can see a day where if you can manage the latency network issues, Maybe someday, but I mean, come on, really. I mean, think about how hard that is, just latency alone. And, and, and the issue is like, architecturally, you have to make really good choices to get there. So I think you might see that in, in like kind of tech software firms who are thinking about, hey, how do I stay cloud neutral? But for the most part, uh, if you want to take the full value of AWS, the full value of GCP, you want to go deeper in there and yeah. use all their services. Yeah, I think that's a great insight. Let's riff on that a little bit because one of the things I was talking to Dave Vellante and Stu Miniman about was um, if you look at the multi-cloud, I don't think it's going to come from a vendor. I think if you look at the success of the Facebooks of the world, even Dropbox where your founders came from, um, early on they had to just basically build it from cloud native, from ground up. And all the hyperscalers used open source. They, they, they built all their stuff. Mm -hmm. No one was selling them anything, they just did it. So I think you, you'll see smart architectural moves, but that'll be the unicorn, that'll not be the standard, that'll be the exception, not the rule. I don't think you can sell multi-cloud, uh, in my opinion, yet, or I don't think that'll even be possible. But I think someone will come out and say, make those architectural mm -hmm. decisions saying, I have an architecture that works multi-cloud because we architect it that way. Yep. Yep, I and I think that that's kind of the the more kind of from an engineering standpoint. I think you'll see more of that. I think from a uh, you know from a kind of solution standpoint, you will see folks saying, "I will help you manage or secure or build into each of the clouds and give you kind of a common pattern." Versus the latter, where an engineering team says, "Here's a way to architect yeah. for multi-cloud." You know, we pay a lot of attention to the next gen kind of psych psychologies. Obviously, we do a lot of coding on with our Cube Cloud. That's coming out now, but how do you see the, the, the founders you're working with and that and this new peer group that's developing, I call it you know, the next gen entrepreneur, technical entrepreneur, as they look at the vast resources of cloud and all the data opportunities there and mobility, internet of things and all, all the stuff going on. What is the general mindset right now of these kinds of entrepreneurs from a technology perspective? How are they looking at the problem space? What's your, what's your take on th this new landscape as an entrepreneur? Yeah, I mean, I'll give you kind of what got me uh, super excited about Sentry, like how, why did I think about that? Which is, if you look at 2000 to 2010, we did software-defined infrastructure. Things started moving into software. 2010 to 2020 was, as you correctly wanted, a cloud, hybrid, everything became kind of as a service. I think this next decade will be about data. So companies uh, using the data to get a competitive advantage or uh, figuring out you know, how to stay ahead, uh, whether it's competitively or even to, to win a market. Uh, and the other aspect of this is because uh, everything is so as a service API centric, I think it's going to explode how we develop things. And I think this is going to be truly now the decade for the developer, uh, who's going to make deeper choices, greater choices, buying decisions. Um, and so with data kind of exploding, uh, and the management of it and getting insights out of it is one aspect of it. And you know, as somebody who's looking at Sentry, we do a lot of that, right? Which is how are customers using it, what are they using it, what languages and everything else that goes with that. But on the other end, 
developers are going to start uh, kind of using things and create a whole new set of use cases that's going to change the way we think about it. So I think there's a whole set of elements yeah. around how to use this infrastructure uh, to build new applications, uh, creative products that that is going to be a massive boom. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I think that's great insight because you think about observability, which I was just joking earlier on about, but I think the relevance of observability is network management applied to value real time, right? Because if you can instrument everything, the smart people are going to say, hey, I could just instrument this and get the data I need rather than dealing with this hassle process we had before. Mm -hmm. So it brings up that kind of philosophy of kill the old to bring in the new or something new that kills the old. So it's an interesting uh, phenomenon. I think it's very relevant. Um, uh, but I want to get your uh, question as a CEO now. You got it, you're at the helm. Helm of a company is technical. And talking about architecture. What's your architecture for the venture? What's your plans? How do you see the, you said you're going to come and build this next level growth. What's your architecture look like? Are you going to do more of the same? Any new things that we see? What are you going to, what's your plan? Yeah, fundamentally, um, you know, we as a um, kind of set of users in the world today uh, have spent a lot of time monitoring, as we, as I told you earlier, machines, systems, and applications, right? And so there's a lot of successful companies doing that. But if you fundamentally believe that this is the decade where you're going to write more code than we've ever before or refresh more applications than we've ever before, our focus is code, and how it does, whether it's in a staging environment, in a canary deployment, or in a production. How do we measure code and monitor code in production? Uh, and the impact of that code to the end user. So it could be errors, and now increasingly code performance. So you will see us kind of venture into this idea of helping developers not only find issues that they run into production like we talked about before, but also be able to say, looks like over the past three releases, our logins per second uh, have gone down progressively 10% per, uh, you know, by 10%. Why is that happening? Where is it happening? Which yeah. team made that change? So you will see us kind of really f uh, you know, double down on this idea of measuring and monitoring code going forward, complementing yeah. how we measure, monitor systems, machines, and applications today. I mean, code has got to be managed as, you, as people, more, people contribute. Mm -hmm. It's like a compiler for the compiler. You know? <laughs> it's like if code fails your business. Code for the code. Yeah. <laughs> meta, so, it's very meta meta as they say, but code for the code. But that's, it's basically code management in a way, right? It's the like code data, you're leveraging that code relationship to the application. And so we talk about applications a lot. And, and so we write code, we store code you know, in a Git repository. Now there is a whole set of elements around securing it. We deploy it. What about measuring and monitoring it? That is, that is the element where we focus and kind of bring that whole cycle together, helping that application developer be successful. What's it like for you going from VMware to the startup? What's the biggest, coolest thing that's happened? It's, uh, it's been a great transition. I, you know, and, and I always say this uh, to folks who ask me for career advice. I say, uh, always choose uh, the, the people you work with and your people you work for. And I've been fortunate enough to do that and I think this transition uh, has been great for that reason alone, which is I've had the time to get to know the team at Sentry. Uh, they got to know me, and it's just been it's it's been fantastic. I think the velocity of and the pace at which I can make changes uh, has been the most fun part of it. And you get like 20,000 20, paying customers, fifty thousand total customers, roughly in that range, pretty sizable. Um, employee count? How many employees do you have? A hundred plus employees and still small, still small, yeah, still small. And and we're going to probably double this year, uh, give or take. Uh, and you know, it's 20,000 customers uh, from every startup. You know, I've spoken to startups, uh, over 100 startups in two months. Uh, and it's amazing to see their reaction on, and their love for Sentry. And funding, how many rounds of funding have you guys done? We just finished CDC uh, in September of last year. 40 million, NEA, Axel growth. Uh, so we feel really good about where we are. Uh, with the revenue ramp that we are seeing, we're in great shape. And pretty good numbers in terms of headcount too. Very leveraged SaaS model get the developers. Yes, right? absolutely. Well, we're going to be entertaining a lot of developers at DockerCon this year. DockerCon used to be an event for Docker, now they sold half the business to Mirantis. They're focusing on Docker developers. We have an event here, we're doing a virtual event. So, um, a lot more developer action coming. 
We'll talk more about that. Let the Meet Your Founders have them come in too. Milan, thank you for coming on. Thank you. Milan Desai, CEO of Century.io, former VMware executive with a great hot startup, Series C funded, growing here in Silicon Valley, San Francisco, and in Austria. I'm John Furrier with theCUBE. Thanks for watching.